Job chapter number 25, if you will. Um, again, we're going to begin a look, uh, a survey of Paul's epistles. So you, you may ask, well, why are we beginning at the book of Job? Well, that's a good question. Uh, and speaking of a question, in, in the book of Job, the oldest book of the Bible, it, it, is, it, is the most, uh, it is the most ancient of the books of the Bible. It is said that Moses, even before he wrote the book of uh, Genesis, he actually had a, a copy of the book of Job. And, and Job, by the way, is one of the sons of Jacob through Jacob's son Issachar. Job is actually mentioned as the son of Issachar. Uh, he was a, 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 a godly man uh, even before uh, the nation of Israel went into the promised land. But anyways, the oldest book of the Bible, it is said. And there's a question that Job himself asked um, about man and in God's dealing with man. Look at Job chapter number 25. I'm going to read a couple of verses. I forgot to pray uh, during the song. This is all new to us as we do this new format, but we'll, we'll have a word of prayer thanking the Lord. Uh, Job chapter 25, if you will, look at verse 4. Job, uh, Job asks, How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man which is a worm. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We stop right now to give you thanks and praise, Father, acknowledging that where we at right now is by your providence, that we as faithful saints who desire to, to see nothing but your glory, uh, people saved and, and edified, and this little band of people, this little flock, you use the, the, the weak things of this world to confound the mighty, your word says. And through this little flock, we can have a testimony, a pillar ground of truth, a testimony to the Northern California uh, area about your grace. That's what we're here for is Northern California Grace Fellowship, to fellowship in your grace for others. Thank you for the radio ministry. Thank you for the saints who, uh, who support us through prayers and financial giving, both here and, and abroad, many abroad, uh, outside of our own uh, region here. And we just thank you we can be a part of what you're doing. We ask for insight and understanding as we study out the things of the Lord from your scriptures. We ask it in Christ's name, amen. The most important, when I deal with people, uh, uh, when I share God's word, there's two basic questions that we have to ask. It really, it really you know, it, life boils down to two questions. When, when people are going to throw stuff at you, but really the two questions is this. If you were to die today, because everybody's going to die eventually, so if the Lord, you know, comes back for a straight, we won't. But eventually, if the Lord tarries another hundred years, everybody in this room will be dead. If the Lord tarries another hundred years, everybody in this room will be dead. So the question is, when you die, do you know for sure where your soul is going to spend eternity? You know you're more than just this outward thing. I, uh, as a secular job, as I build up uh, this ministry in time, I drive uh, senior citizens around, and many of them in the 90s and the 100s, and just talking to them about their physical infirmity. I take them to their doctor's appointment. And there's a lot of doctor's appointments, right? They're breaking down. And, and they tell me their they're, they're inner man, they, they know this. Lost people know their inner man feels like it did when they were 16. They, uh, inside, you don't, you don't age, but your outer man perishes. And so you know there's more to that. And so the, the question comes from Job is, uh, you're going to have to deal with your creator, and we're going to see that. That's why Paul is in your Bible, to, to, to explain who this creator God is. And there's, there's one person and one thing that proves that you're going to stand before God when you die. Watch this. He says in verse 4, how then can man be justified with God? That's a great question. Justified means to be declared righteous in the eyes of a holy God. God is perfect. He's righteous. He's holy. You and I are fallen creatures. We sin. Everybody sins. When Revelation 21 verse 8 says that all liars will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is second death. And I've used that verse with unbelievers. And they said, well, I don't believe that. I said, whether you believe it or not, it's not the issue right now. What does that verse say? And, and have you ever told a lie? Yes, everyone has. That's what they say. And then I say, well, how many lies must you tell to be a liar? When they think about it, uh, one. So we've all qualified as all liars. And it says the second death. That means you die physically, but then there's a separation from Almighty God in hell and eventually like a fire. So how can you reconcile that? Notice it says... How then can man be justified or be declared righteous with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? That, therefore, you're unclean when you're born from your mother's womb, not just because of the birthing process, 
But you're, you're, you're created with the genetic code of your parents, and that's sin. There are my parents back there. My father and my mother, I look like a conglomerate of those two in the flesh, physically. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> That's my excuse there. Thank you, buddy. But I know it because my little daughter, who hardly eats anything, she has a belly, too. And she, her body type is like Krista and me. That's just genetic. But I inherit something else from my parents, particularly my father, because the sin nature comes from the father. And that's sin. And sin is falling short of the perfection of God. Now, when God looks at humanity, he's going to compare humanity to a man who lived named Jesus, who was perfect. We'll get to him in a minute. And I don't care how many good works you do, how many bad works you do, how, many, how much charity you give. All these things, God is going to, he's going to put you in the scales of justice and say, here's Jesus. He's perfect. Where do you fall? And just like I might be able to jump maybe two feet off the Grand Canyon and fall, an Olympic, you know, the Summer Olympics come and a, a sprinter can jump farther than me or whatever. We all going to fall, and that's what sin does to humanity. No matter where you fall on that, that, that scale of righteousness and human, humanized, you still fall short of God's glory, which is perfection in Jesus. So what can we do? Look at verse number five. Behold even to the moon. You know, uh, Job has so much scientific evidence. You know, I, I dealt with atheists a lot, and they say, oh, well, how do you know the Bible's God? Well, because of the scientific evidence. There are things written down through these Jewish, Hebrew, Israelites that the heathen around them didn't know. Usually the heathen is about 2,000 years after the Bible. When Isaiah said that the earth is a circle, Columbus has said, Christopher Columbus, is, he says it, he used that verse as he went on his voyages because everybody else thought that the earth was flat. He'd go over. He says, nope, the Bible says it's round, and by faith he went out. Job, the book of Job, the oldest book of the Bible says that the earth hangeth, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. The people in Job's day thought it was on the back of a turtle and all these other heathen ideas. And we now know through technology you can get out there, the earth just hangs upon nothing. Just like, how did Job know that? How did Isaiah know that? An extraterrestrial, someone uh, not of this world told me it was God, the spirit of God. Well, even to the moon, and it shineth not in the... Compared to the glory of God, the moon doesn't shine. Notice verse 5. The stars are not pure in his sight. Another verse says that the, the heavens are not clean in his sight. He put no trust in his saints and the angels. God, he's so holy, even angels who are perfect in, in their in creation, the ones who haven't fallen, doesn't compare. Verse 6. How much less man? I mean, we're made lower than the angels. That is a worm. When God looks at man, he sees him as a worm, some unclean little dweller in the dust and the son of man or his offspring which is a worm and that's the question of life not your 401k that can come and go not not the things of this world even if you live 100 years i'm seeing these uh, elderly people 90 100 years they all ready to go and die but they're not many of them aren't ready to go before the holy living god and that's my struggle because i can only say so much because anyway Pray for me, y'all, because I'm going to talk. If they bring it up, I'll, I'll bring up the gospel. But here, those of you who are here and listening, we can know the answer. We can know how to be, be right with God. Go with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter number one. The apostle Paul is in your Bible to give you that answer today. By the way, the second question would be, once someone is saved and know for sure they have eternal life, why is Paul in the Bible? Because as you can see through this chart, God has been dealing with one people for, 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 for thousands of years. Uh, from, from Adam to Abraham, that 2,000 year period, he dealt with all men, whoever wanted him, whoever desired him. Obviously, we're going to see in Romans chapter 1 that man did not want the living God. So what happened? God chose out one man. And that Abram the Hebrew, that's where we get the Hebrew people, the Hebrew language, the book of Hebrews. That's Abram the Hebrew, and through his seed... God created a nation of people, Abraham, then Isaac, his son, not Ishmael. The, the Muslims claim Ishmael, but God made the promise to Isaac. Then Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau, not Esau. The Muslims claim Esau, but not, it wasn't Esau, it was Jacob, who God changed his name to Israel. And for thousands of years in scripture, God's been dealing with one people. Jesus was a Hebrew, a Jew, an Israelite. I mean, he just dealt with one people. Now all of a sudden he dealt with the Romans. The Romans were the, the, the Gentiles who had Israel under their hand back 2,000 years ago. 
How did the God of Israel start dealing with you and me, as, as the book of Romans says, through that man, Paul? So whether it's you're lost and you need to know how to be right with the living God, or you're saved today and you want to know how to be right with the living God in your Christian walk, you're going to have to listen to Paul. Let's see that. Look at verse 1. Romans 1, verse 1. Paul. Every book that Paul writes starts with his name. You know, question comes up amongst Christians. Who wrote Hebrews? Whether Paul wrote it and people get in. It really doesn't matter because God wrote all scripture. Paul says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, Peter says to Israel. So whether God puts the man's name on it, Paul, or whether God chooses to put his own name, God, the first word of Hebrews, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God, it's all written by God, okay? But when God puts the man's name on it, you know what he's doing? He's magnifying that man's office. And there are 13 books of your Bible, interesting, 13 books of your Bible start with this man, Paul. Romans through Philemon, Paul, 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 Paul. Moses, the great Moses, the great deliverer of Israel, Guess how many verse, uh, books he wrote? Five. Deut uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy. John, the, the, the great, not John the Baptist, but the great apostle John, one of the 12 original apostles of Jesus' earthly ministry, he wrote the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation. Five, that's 10. One apostle, one man, wrote more than both of them combined. 13 books, the Apostle Paul. Paul. God is magnifying Paul's office. And, and, and if God magnifies Paul's office, we must do it too. Why? Because today, you and I, where we live in Scripture, the Bible is past, present, future. You understand that. You, live, you have a past, you live in the present, you have a future. Well, the Bible is that way. There's a past program with it, one nation of Israel. What God is doing today, he's doing to you and me as Gentiles or the nations through Paul's Doctrine, the dispensation of grace. Once this dispensation of grace is over, God's going to deal with, look, look at the books that come after Paul. What's the next book? Hebrews. Hebrews through Revelation. That's the end of the prophetic program with Israel. He's going to finish it. Past. Genesis through Acts is past. Romans through Philemon is the present dispensation of grace. Hebrews through Revelation, that's the future. Now, let's look at our doctrine. What, this is what God has to say to you and me. Verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. That, that word apostle means a sent one. Here he defines it as separated unto the gospel of God. God separated one man out of humanity named Paul. But he has an office for him. He's going to be the sent one of, the, of God. By the way, of Jesus Christ. The gospel of God, the good news of God. Gospel means good news. Now watch the parentheses. Watch the, the thought. Verse 2. This gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets, where? In the Holy Scriptures. When you read the Old Testament, the Holy Scriptures before Paul's epistles, God has been promising from the beginning a redeemer. And in Genesis 3, when man falls, God says to the serpent, Satan, he says, the seed of the woman will destroy your seed. And that has been the, the, the focus of prophecy. That good news of God culminates in the coming of his son, particularly the resurrection of Jesus. That's why the Bible you can be trusted. Watch this. Verse 2, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who? Jesus Christ our Lord which was made of the seed of who? David, according to the flesh. Jesus Christ was the son of David, the Messiah of Israel. God promised David in 2 Samuel 7 a kingdom, David the king, his son Solomon. David is a type of the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bloody man, Christ died. Solomon, his son, means peace, shalom, shalom, Solomon, shalom, peace, the prince of peace. In Christ's first coming, he was the bloody man, he died. In his second coming, he would be the king of peace, the prince of peace. Solomon was a type of that. But when he was made of the seed of David, there's his royal blood, but he was human. Christ was, Jesus was, that man, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived just like you and me. There's no doubt he lived. It's what, do you believe who he said he was, who the scripture said he was? Do you believe that that Jew who lived back there named Jesus of Nazareth, as real as you and me in the flesh, was the son of God. He was the seed of David, came through David's lineage. He had the royal 
line of the throne of Israel. So he, there's his humanity. He was 100% man. He was the most special person in, in, in creation because he was 100% man. Look at verse 3. Concerning his son, Christ, uh, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the what? The flesh. Why does he need flesh? Well, we learn from Hebrews study, he had to die. The life of the flesh is in the blood. He had to become humanity to, to come and die for the sins of Adam's race that Adam brought. As by one man, sin entered the world, Romans 5, and death by sin. That's Adam. You know why you go to funerals? You know why you hurt and you, and you, and you do wrong thing and you suffer? Because of sin. One man sinned in the world and death by sin. So the death passed upon all men for all have sinned. But in Adam all, all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive. He's life. Adam equals death. Jesus equals life. God created man to live forever. Well, notice this in verse 4. So Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the what? Dead. Hey. Muhammad's tomb still has a body. Confucius' tomb all has a body. The tomb of Jesus Christ was empty. The empty tomb. Where's the body? The scriptures testify. The greatest thing about the scriptures is it testifies that Jesus rose from the dead. And if he rose from the dead, he's God. Because he says, I will die and I will raise myself back up. Man can claim to do that. He's the only one who did it. Well, that proves that he was God. So he's not only 100% man, but he's 100% God. He's the God man. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, look at verse 5. It is by that Jesus Christ, Paul says, by whom we. Now the we there is Paul and his, and his ministers at this time. He wrote this book about A.D. 60 years after his, his, his uh, about 30, oh, nearly 30 years, 20 something plus years after he was saved on the road to Damascus. There, there's Paul and his ministers. He says, by whom we have received, what? Grace. Look at this dispensation called grace. This is the free gift. God is not requiring you to work like he did mankind back here. When God raised out up the nation of Israel through Moses, right when they came out of Egypt, he gave them a law, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments and so forth. He gave them moral law. He gave them civil laws for, for a nation. He gave them ceremonial laws for their religious system. And Israel, those 613 commandments that those Jews kept, that was how they approached Almighty God. That's performance-based acceptance. When you rightly divide God's word, what God gave the Apostle Paul was the opposite. The opposite of performance-based acceptance is the free gift. No works. You get accepted by God based upon what Jesus did. See, it's the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the difference. And so God can be gracious. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's grace. Here, they had to work for it. The law, performance, performance. Do the law, do the law, keep the law. If you don't, I'm going to curse you, I'm going to curse you. When Paul is saved, he's the first person ever saved by God's grace through faith plus no works. He just believed on Jesus. He's the first man who ever had a hope of dying and going to heaven. No, nobody had a hope to die and go to heaven with God. These Jews would have stoned you had you mentioned that, as a Gentile especially, but even as a Jew. They, their hope was to die and go into Abraham's bosom paradise in the heart of earth, wait for Messiah to come and set up his kingdom and resurrect them into the kingdom. It's Paul who now has a hope for dying and going to heaven. That's God's grace. We can be in the presence of God, not based upon our own works, but what Christ did for us. Well, let's keep going. So we receive grace, verse 5, and apostleship. We're going to be sent out to get this myth. You know, it's, it's his mission is our mission. You heard of the great commission? Christianity talks about the great commission of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've heard of it, the great commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. But that's not our doctrine. We have a greater commission, a grace commission, 2 Corinthians 5. Co-mission, co-mission. What's the mission of Almighty God to see people saved and save people edified? We share with that mission, commission. We share that equally with Paul. Well, that's why we have this outreach ministry now. Watch what we have to do. Verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. The faith is the doctrine. That's been on my heart. I said, I have to preach the doctrine. We have to obey this doctrine. So on Sundays, we're going to survey Paul's epistles. We're going to get it. I'm not going to go into everything that I see. We're going to survey this thing. I could stay 
10 weeks in the first verse, but we can't, we don't have time. We're going to just survey Paul. But we get it, but, but we have to do it. Obedience to the faith, that doctrine, among how many nations? All nations for his name. Remember, God only dealt with one nation in time past, the nation of Israel. When God raised up the Apostle Paul, that's why once you're saved, the second question I have for you is, why is Paul in your Bible? Most Christians are over in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in their own reading. Most preachers at this moment are preaching from the Gospels. But that's Jesus Christ back under the law. That's Jesus Christ sent to Israel, that one nation. Why in the world are they back there when they should be here? God has a message to all nations. You read the Gospels. I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He calls us dogs in Matthew 15, the Gentile dogs. God doesn't look at us as dogs today. He looks at us as sons and daughters of God if we trust Christ. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. It's dispensational. Look at verse number five again. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Oh, I love this. Among whom are ye also the called of who? Jesus Christ. God has called us into the fellowship of his son. And for God to tell those Romans, you don't understand this. That's why I got to make it clear. At the time Paul writes this book to these Gentiles, they were hated among the Jews. And the Jews hated the Romans and the Romans hated the Jews. And those Jews would cause riots and sedition trying to get these Romans off their back without the power of God. They, interesting, Jesus was sent to get the Romans off their back if they were trusted. What they do, they crucify their own Messiah. Then after he's raised from the dead and goes to the heavens, he pours out the spirit upon Peter and the 12 at Pentecost, preaching a renewed opportunity. Kingdom is prophesied back in the Old Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the kingdom is at hand. Repent for the kingdom happens at hand. In the book of Acts, the kingdom is offered. What did they do? Receive it? No, they stoned the prophet Stephen. That's when God says, okay, you guys don't want it. I'm going to send it to the Gentiles. And that's Paul. Now watch this. It's this message. The kingdom has been postponed. That earthly kingdom has been postponed. One day when God has finished his, 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 his body of Christ for the heavenly places, God will then establish the kingdom of heaven on earth through that believing remnant of Israel. That's your Bible. And if you don't study your Bible that way, you'll never, you'll never understand it. Notice what it says here in verse number seven. To all that be in Rome, how important is that? How is the God of the Jews, the Hebrew God of the Bible, dealing with Romans? By grace. You know, on Daniel's 70th week, I've had many people go, go through that timeline, you know, uh, Babylon, Babylonians, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, Alexander the Great and the Greeks, Daniel prophesied about them, uh, uh, the, the, then the Romans. But the Romans aren't included there. That, 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 that next kingdom is the Antichrist kingdom out here, and it comes out of the Grecian kingdom. It's the eastern part of Alexander the Great's four, four parts. His kingdom, went, after his death, was broken into four parts, north, south, east, and west. That eastern part of that Grecian empire, where that Antichrist is going to come in the future, God didn't include the Romans. You know why? Because he got grace and peace on the Romans. You've got you to remember, the Romans were in power when God poured out his grace. And to prove it, he writes a book through Paul called Romans. Interesting. Watch this. He says, verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of who? God. Called to be saints. Saints means sanctified, set apart ones. Oh, look at the declaration of our apostle from our Lord. Grace to you and what? Peace from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have grace and peace in your life? You know, God has a plan to give you grace and peace in your life. And if you don't have it, that's not because God didn't give it out to you or make it available. You have to trust it. See, to have the grace of God and the peace of God, first you have to trust Jesus as your Savior. We'll give the clear gospel at the end of this program, at the end of this study. But then even as a believer, Paul says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Go to chapter 5. Let me show you something. Romans 5. Go over a couple of pages. Verse 5, verse 1, Romans 5, 1. Therefore being justified by faith, we'll deal more with that in a, in a moment, we have what with God? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access. 
You understand how you access it. You can be a believer. You can be in the body of Christ, trusted Christ, and, and be a mess in your life. You can. It happens all the time. But the way you access the grace and peace of Almighty God is, verse 2, by whom? By Jesus Christ also we have access by what? Faith into this grace wherein we stand. The access, in other words, I can be a billionaire and decide to gift you $10 million. I'll say, I put that $10 million in a bank account at your bank. But unless I give you the access code, the account number, the writing of all this stuff, you, you, you could be just as poor just living out on the street with $10 million in the bank. That's most believers. They're like spiritual paupers. Paul calls them that. Weak and beggarly elements of the law when you have the ex excelling glory of grace. But you have to believe the word. And I, I, I tell atheists back in the day, I said, look here, God is not, he's not going to force it. He's a gentleman. Hebrews says, for without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe first that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God would rather you just say, okay, God, if you for real, prove yourself to me. God says, okay. But when I do, you got to believe it. Don't shut your eyes to it. But you're not asking God anything. Just say, Lord, show yourself. If it's sincerity, I want to know. Just, he'll, he'll give it to you. He wants, he wants you to be saved more than you want to be saved. He wants you to know him more than you want to know him. He wants us to know the truth more than we want to know the truth. All that striving in prayer, God wants that more than you. So you got to trust him, but it's by faith. That's how you have access. Go back to chapter 1, if you will. Romans chapter number 1. Look at verse 7, if you will. To all that be of, in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Even before Paul got to Rome physically himself. Thank you, Ryan, for the maps. Brother Ryan is gracious enough to get these maps. We definitely use them for our Acts study following Paul. But let me show you something real quick. Okay, These are the apostolic journeys of Paul. You probably can't see it that well. Here's Rome. Paul started out as a man in Jerusalem there and on the road to Damascus up, up north there. But he, he covered all that area right there, the then known Roman Empire. He's writing, he's at Corinth now. He's right here when he writes the book of Romans, right here in the, in the, in the, Greek, in the Greek area. He wants to get there. He eventually gets there. We're studying that on Wednesday, the book of Acts. Be with us. He gets to Rome. But before he physically gets there, watch this. He through saints, through other saints, the gospel of grace has gotten out there. Watch what he says there. Verse number uh, eight. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, when he says the whole world, he's talking about the then known Roman Empire, that world, the, the, the world that they knew. The Romans had listened to Paul with a little bit of, of doctrine that he did have. There was more to come of this mystery, the 13th. He only had, this was only the sixth book, book written. There was Galatians. There was 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. There was 1st uh, and 2nd Corinthians. And then Romans, okay? He still had seven to go. But this, you know, so he had partial, partial knowledge. But the little bit of understanding they did have, they got it out there. Look at verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit, in the gospel or the good news of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of, of you always in my prayers. You know, I start off each day by praying about the, the, the uh, thanking the Lord and praying for you all. And that's why I remind you to pray for each other. Uh, prayer is a divine operating asset that you help God. It's not like you're telling him anything he doesn't already know. Prayer is designed to keep your heart soft to God and towards others. When you pray to God, you do that by faith. There's a connection. When you pray about your brothers and sisters in Christ, you, it keeps your heart soft towards them. Paul did that. Look at verse 10. Make your request. You can make requests. Make your request known unto God, Philippians 4. Make your request, verse 10, if by any means. Now, here's Paul's request. I love this. Who put this right here? I was just thinking about some more. Thank you, Mother. I'm like, Jonathan said some more. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. I was just thinking about that. I got to talk about this. Every day we've been here, it's just nice and cool. I think they turn it off on Sundays. So we got to talk to them about that. Okay, I'll find out how to get it. No, it's, it's cool out in the hall. 
it's real cool in that okay. corner. Well, we'll open this door first, just because I know sometimes. Anyway, we'll, it'll be better. We'll work on it, okay? So just bear with us. We only got 20 minutes in this study, then we can open up doors and stuff um, during Q&A. Um, we, we do have other tenants we have to be aware in our first day. We want to be cool. All right, here we go. Verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. Verse 10. Make your request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. What was Paul's prayer? Is that, look at our map here. He's at Corinth. Eventually, you know, he's, he's an apostle. He's setting up churches. He's establishing people, teaching them the doctrine. He hasn't written all the, the mystery of Christ, the doctrine down yet. So he has to go there and God's given spiritual, that's what the spiritual gifts were for, tongues and all this to communicate doctrine. But he wants to get there to see him in, in, in the flesh. He, he gets there eventually. But until then, he said, may God get me there prosperously. And the prosperous, the, the, the prosperous is the fact that he would have some doctrine to communicate to them. Let's keep going. Let's show you that. Verse 11. For I long to see you. That, here's the purpose. I may impart unto you. Now, not, if he didn't say spiritual gifts. Most people read that and they think Paul's going to go there and lay hands and people are going to speak in tongues and all this. Well, I already knew, but as I put my study together for, for a couple of weeks study at Brother Jordan's, He's not talking about spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. The spiritual gift is the, the Word of God. Watch this, verse 12. That is, that I, uh, verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end. Here's the purpose. Ye may be what? Established. Established, established in the faith. Colossians 2. Paul wants to get there. I mean, look at his prayer. Lord, let me get there so I can teach them your word. I mean, you can't pray a greater prayer than that. You start off your day, Lord, give me understanding so I can share it with others. Man, he, boom, he'd give it to you, man. Verse number 12, that is that I may be comforted. Paul got comfort out of people believing God's word like him. Fantastic. Let me tell you something. When we share this message, look at this little church, look for people. Big old churches out there, they don't know nothing about God's word. They're confusing people. We share this message, most of the people, about 99% of the people are going to reject it. But can I tell you, that 1% of people who say, you got something there, Brother Ron, I see that. Yeah, I was wondering about this. this now it's making sense. You're putting the pieces of the puzzle together. That thing's going to refresh and comfort you and keep you going for the battle. It is. After being rejected, 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 eventually somebody's going to say, I see it. I'm coming to your church. You invite them, and they get it, and they say, I'll be back next week. Y'all, we got a place now. We can do that. Notice the comfort Paul got, verse 12. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. This is a shared faith. I always meet somebody new to the Grace Message at these Grace Conferences. And if you're new to the Grace Message, you haven't been to a conference yet, you don't even know what you, well, in time you'll go, because you don't understand. There are people in this in this world, in this land, who know this same doctrine, who believe it like you and rejoice. And you, they might be a stranger to you, but when y'all get to talking about this, this message and your church experience and all that, it's like y'all been, y'all one in spirit, like y'all just know each other for, for years. When you go to a grace conference, I always meet somebody for the first time, and they'll give me their testimony, how they've been confused and denomination stopped going to church, they heard somebody on the radio, blah, blah, blah. You hear, as we get visitors, you get it. And they'll say, Brother Ron, this is like a, a breath of fresh air. And I say, I know. Yeah, it's God's grace. That, that, that's repeated over and over. That's the mutual faith, both of you and me. Verse 13. Now watch this. Now I would not have you, what? Ignorant brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Now six times, really seven, but six times Paul says, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren. We'll be going over those. Seven, he says, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, 2 Corinthians 2. Every six, every one of those six things is a, is a satanic attack about the doctrine. The first thing is Paul's apostleship, first thing. The second thing is the mystery. First, uh, Romans 11, I would not have you, brethren, uh, ignorant about the mystery. What's the mystery? What you haven't been taught in church is that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. 
Then shall all Israel be saved, as it is written. Churches are blinded and they're hiding the mystery, the secret purpose of God for the body of Christ. That through the fall of the nation of Israel, not their rise, through their fall, salvation has come out to us Gentile. That's the mystery. And Paul says, don't be ignorant of it. So the first thing you need to know is Paul is your apostle. The second thing is he's their apostle because Israel has fallen. God's not dealing with them today. He's dealing with Jews and Gentiles, all the same in, in the body. The, the third time, 1 Corinthians 10 Paul says, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, about how Israel was baptized or identified with Moses for their sanctification. So, too, I'm just not your apostle to get you started. Many believers say, well, yeah, Paul's gospel, the cross is, you know, God, you're saved by God's grace through faith. Plus nothing. That's Paul's gospel. But when you and I tell them that Paul is also the one they need to listen to for sanctification. Oh, no, no. You worship Paul, we worship Jesus. They'll say that. You guys make too much of Paul. We, No, no, no. Just like the Jews were saved out of Egypt through Moses, God's work through Moses, their sanctification came through the word that God gave Moses, the law. Just like Paul's message of Jesus Christ dying on the cross is what saves you, it is also the doctrine that sanctifies you. You're justified by the cross of Christ, but the doctrine of Paul also sanctified you. Great message. Then there's 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Why trouble comes. I would not have you ignorant of our trouble. When God sent trouble to the nation of Israel, it was a covenant promise to them. Leviticus 26, when they were cursed of God, not keeping the law, God sent curses. There are verses where God says, I, I create evil. And then an unbeliever, they, ah, look at your God, he creates evil. Well, that's in Isaiah. And Isaiah was a prophet of Israel. And God covenanted to create evil when they broke the law. Just like he covenanted to, to take evil away when they kept the law. Today in the dispensation of grace, in Romans 8, we're going to see that the sufferings of this present time, the hard times that happen to you and me, and most of it is our own fault, by the way. But sometimes stuff just happens. The curse is random on the creation, the curse that Adam brought. Believers get sick. Unbelievers get sick. Believers get cancer. Unbelievers get cancer. God healed me of my cancer. Unbelievers who don't believe on Jesus, their cancer goes into remission too. Believers have car accidents. Unbelievers have car accidents. So forth, so on. It's the sufferings of this present time. God sent suffering to Israel. He allows suffering. By the way, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 1, it's so that you might trust in the living God. Suffering is designed to draw you closer to the Lord. That's what he designed suffering to do. Okay? And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He doesn't want you ignorant about what happens to death, to, to the, when grace believers die. They're with the Lord. What happens to end this dispensation? We all go to be with the Lord in the air, the rapture, the resurrection of the body of Christ. Okay? Well, here, as we come down. Today, we've got 15 minutes. Notice he says here, verse 13, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose, here's what's God's, Paul's purpose to get God's word to them. But look at the parentheses, but was let hither too. What does that mean? That the old English word let means to hinder. Satan would hinder him. He had all good intentions, but Satan and his policy of evil was always there to hinder Paul. It didn't stop him. And God was using that resistance from Satan to, to, to you know, catch Satan in his craftiness, but also to teach Paul to trust God. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul asked God the Lord three times to remove this messenger from Satan, and he says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God allows these things to get us to trust his grace. Satan didn't stop Paul getting there. Where's my mouth? It's on the floor, but Satan didn't stop him. He got there. Now, let's keep reading. Verse number uh, 13. Why did he want to get there? That I might have some what? Fruit. Among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Let me put it back up there. So by the time Paul gets to Rome, we're going to be studying this book every week. We're going to go right on through Paul's epistles. By the time he gets there, Paul then went all over this then known Roman Empire. He had churches all over here. Here's Galatia and, and, the, and Berea and Philippi and just Achaia, all this area here, all through here, Ephesians, 
the Colossians, they're all over there. He's got churches everywhere, man. The whole then on Roman Empire had Pauline Grace churches. By the way, they were all like this. A little small, little, most of them was house churches. Sometimes they did meet like the Corinthians. They had a little more money. They met in the, in the little common place. But they were small. Verse number 14, why? I am a debtor. I owe this to you, both to the Greeks and to the who? The barbarians. Why didn't Paul say, I am a debtor to the Romans? Remember the Greeks, the Greco-Roman world, Greco-Roman wrestling, all that, that. Why the Greeks? Well, the Greeks, from Alexander the Great, that culture, the education system, that, that mindset of wisdom, human wisdom, say Plato and Socrates and Euripides and all these guys who ripped off Solomon's wisdom from the Old Testament. All, they just ripped off. All the Greek philosophers of antiquity ripped off the wisest man ever lived from God uh, before Jesus, Solomon. Plagiarized Solomon, didn't give God the glory. Check it out. Well, so the Greco-Roman, I mean, even to our days, colleges with sororities and fraternities, the Greek alpha, this, that's just the spirit of wisdom. Because look how he, he, he compares it to a group called the barbarians. Not on our swords and aren't, what are y'all, y'all, uh, got me right here? <laughs> how y'all? Well, Minnesota can't talk because Jesse the Body Ventura wrestled was their governor. And I'm from Illinois where every governor that's been in office is in prison, so, you know, we all got problems. <laughs> Blagojevich, Tom, I mean, Ryan. Ryan, Joe, Ryan. Thanks, man. There's another one. We can't talk. I joke. I joke with Chris. I say y'all had a wrestler as governor, of Minnesota. My wife's from Minnesota. And then y'all had a guy who can barely speak English as governor of it, or action guy, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, almost every governor in the past, you know, 30 years of, in, in uh, Illinois has been indicted for something. So it's all they are. Politics, religion and politics is corrupt. God hates religion, he hates politics. God loves faith and he loves human government if it's righteous, but he hates religion and politics, okay? Just remember that. All politics, not all, most are corrupt anyway, okay? Like Pontius Pilate. All right, let's keep going. So the barbarians, look at chapter 1, verse 14. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Now watch how he describes them. Both to the what? Wise and the unwise. The barbar so, so the barbarians were the opposite of the Greeks. The Greeks were highfalutin intellectuals. And the barbarians were just lewd fellows of the basic sort. Just come in the barbarian and cut you up. And Paul says, if you're human, I, I owe you the gospel of grace. You need to get saved. Interesting. It didn't matter your culture, your, your, your excuse me, your, 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 your um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Your, your, your place in society. Paul says that in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek. Male nor female, your gender doesn't matter. Bond or free, your social status. Black or white, doesn't matter. We're all one in Christ, see? We have an all-man message. And whether you are wise or unwise, verse 15, so as much as in me is, remember he didn't have it all. He, Paul knew he didn't have all the doctrine yet. He would come with visions and revelations. As much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel, the good news to you that are in Rome. Oh, most famous verse of chapter 1, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the, what? Power of God unto salvation to everyone that is water baptized, to the Jew first and also to the, huh? Y'all know that's why we have our Bibles out. Most churches you don't see where they just, I mean, they have some Bibles under there, but you don't have to open it. No, no, no. We got our King James Bibles here because it's Bible study. Most people think that you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. That's religion. Let me tell you what water baptism is associated with. Israel's Messiah. John says to Israel, I would have not have known him except he that sent me, the man sent from God, saith, Whomsoever you baptize and see this Holy Ghost, he is the one who is the sent one of Israel. In other words, he baptized the people of Israel. It, it, was, a, a, it was the little flock uh, identifying with their Messiah, Jesus. Water baptism is always associated with the Hebrew program. 
Even the Great Commission where he sends them out to baptize all nations, that's part not of our dispensation. Close the chart if the dispensation of grace didn't happen. Water baptism is part of the prophetic program. In fact, Israel gets it because they're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And the two ordinances of a priest, Exodus 29, you, you wash them with water, there's the baptism, and you anoint them with oil. That's why when Jesus was baptized, he was poured the water on them, sprinkled them, and then the Spirit of God came down. The water represented the baptism. The, 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 the oil represented the anointing of the Spirit of God. Neither one of those are for us today. When you rightly divide the word, what Israel did through symbols and outward signs, water, we got by pure grace the spiritual one. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 1, Christ sent me not to baptize. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into, into one body. The spirit of God is the one who baptizes us. Not a man. It's a spiritual thing, not an outward thing. Well, we got to come down here and look at verse number 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, that gospel, that preaching of that cross, it, that's where the power lies. Watch this. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that what? Believeth. This is the continual operating principle of this dispensation of grace. Whether it's Paul's day, whether it's our day, if it extend, God extends it another hundred years, that's the way it's going to be until this thing is over. You need to believe, which is to trust the Lord Jesus Christ exclusively. None of yourself, none of your works, no water baptism, no going to church, no giving a tithe, no, all these things. When people find out I'm a pastor, it's the funniest thing. I don't even, I don't even have to tell them because I don't want to talk to them. Really, I'm sorry. They find out I teach the Bible. They say, oh, brother. I, they go, oh, I should go to church. And I go, oh, no, you shouldn't. You should see their face. Because they, they're so re you know, religious-minded, they find out I teach the Bible. They say, oh, yeah, I should be going to church. And I say, oh, no, you shouldn't. They, they look at what? And I tell them, no, you need to be in the church. I, I should go to church? No, you should be in the Bible. So then you got to open. They don't need to go to church. What's the church going to teach them? Except it's a grace church, a Pauline grace church. Nothing. It's going to confuse them. They don't rightly divide. They don't understand Paul's ministry. Watch this. Verse 16 and 17, then we'll end. Pick up next week. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Notice the good news is not of your baptism or of the Roman Catholic Church. The good news of Christ. He's the good news. That person, through this man, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and that all things by which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses, you can through him. Acts 13, 38, 39. It's him. The gospel of Christ. For it, that preaching of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, Paul, his, his ministry during the book of Acts, which Romans was written, was to the Jew first. He'd go into synagogues. Because God was diminishing that nation, get, provoking them to come and get saved like Gentiles. And then also to the Greek. Verse 17. Now we're going to have to pick up 17, 18 next week. We're going to look at one verse in 1 Corinthians uh, 1. For therein, for in that gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Next week we're going to see what does Paul mean from faith to faith? What does that mean? And then we're going to see verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Why talking about Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross? What does that have to do for the wrath of God? Well, next week we're going to see what it has to do. And then we're going to go on and see the rest of the, the chapter that says, Hey, Brother Ron, what about the indigenous people? What about the heathen out there who never heard of Jesus? What God going to do with them? See, I, 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 You hear it all. We're going to see how God's going to deal with them next week. Now let's end in one... Verse, go to 1 Corinthians, the next book over, chapter number 1. This power of God. That same gospel that saves you, and we'll give the gospel, we'll end it with the gospel, is the same gospel that keeps you saved. It's the same gospel that edifies and sanctifies you, sets you apart to God. Same doctrine, simplicity of God's grace. Watch this. 
Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 17. 117, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the what? That's the gospel of grace, Acts 20, 24. Not with wisdom of words. Remember he says to the Greeks, these Corinthians, oh, I took my map down. They all oh, they love the, the they love the wisdom. They just go to Mars Hill and just stand there just to hear the orators talk about things that they don't know nothing about. It's nonsense. And the things that they hit on were just plagiarized from Solomon anyway. Interesting enough, who God has wrote through Solomon. Well, not with wisdom of words. Brent, you trusted Christ, so you need to come back next week because you need to be water baptized. See, that, that's wisdom of words. Glory in your flesh gets you to come back. It's, 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 it's to everybody's advantage to come back to a great shirt week after week, Wednesday through, and, and Sunday. But not so that I can submit the man to water baptism. No, no, no. That goes against the word of God through Paul. I'm not going to use wisdom of words. I'm going to explain to a reasonable, logical, reasonable, intellectual person. This is the truth of God's word. This is the only way. It is the rational way to get to the living God. Remember why we started? How shall man be just with God? How can she, he that is born of a woman unclean be clean? You want to know how to clean your sins? It needs to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Maybe we'll finish on that song. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's finish here. Not with wisdom of words, verse 17, lest the what of Christ? The cross of Christ should be made of none effect, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. That means they die and go to hell. Foolishness. They say, no, no, no. Can't believe that foolishness. But unto us which are saved, if you got an NIV, it says being saved. There's no security there. Which are saved... It is the preaching of that cross, the power of God. Verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. The wiser they're trying to be in their own thinking, God hides it from them. When you're trying to be weak and just listen to the word of God, he opens up your eyes of your understanding. Watch this. The world by wisdom, verse 21, knew not God. It pleased God by the, quote, unquote, Paul's being facetious, the foolishness of what? Preaching, preaching to save them that believe. You know why you come? To get the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. To preach, proclaim, and speak that word. And God has chosen that method. The more that I've preached 15 years, you know what I've learned? I can read this at home. Get it. I understand. But something spiritual happens. There's a dynamic, a power when you stand and preach it. Because I learn. I learn. It's weird. I'm naturally like shy and quiet. I don't even like doing people. But what happens is the word in me is like Jeremiah says, you know, it was Jeremiah told Israel, I'm not going to tell y'all God's word, y'all don't want it. But it just will eat them up alive. Like I, I'm, I'm up on Sunday mornings like this, man, like, a, like I am in the Baptist church. I'm, I'm ready to go. I got to get it out. I'll be jacked up. Why? Because of the word of God. And I got something to show you from the scripture. The power of God through preaching saves them, but you got to believe it. What to believe? If, if no one has ever loved you enough to ask you, and I say love, because you know what? Your parents love you, mom and dad, your friends. But unless your parents raise you up in the truth of Almighty God, they don't really love you. I'm just talking from God's point of view. We can be real. I'm a preacher. Your friends love you. But unless they talk to you about God, I'm talking about people you got a rapport with who, who's claiming they love you. I'm not talking about strangers. I love you. If no one ever loved you enough, because I don't care how rich you are, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, the Lord said, and yet lose his own soul? And what can a man exchange for his soul? What are you going to give God to get out of hell? Nothing. You have nothing. You're bankrupt. You're, you're dead in sins. True love is to say, if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? Well, if no one ever loved you enough to ask you that, I love you. But more importantly, God loves you. And Paul says in Romans 5, verse 8, we'll see the verse in a few weeks. But God commended, he demonstrated and proved his love in a tangible way in human history. Jesus of Nazareth was actually on this planet Earth, and he died on a cruel and criminal Roman cross. Now, what you do with that, that's between you and God. 
But the Bible says he died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And if you trust that, if you believe on Jesus, God will save you this moment. He'll give you eternal life, the gift of God. The wages of sin is death. What your sin gets you at the end of your job of sinning against God is death, second death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How long is eternity? Forever. And the gifts and calling to God without repentance. He doesn't change it. You didn't do anything to get saved. He did it. You didn't do anything to stay saved. He did it. You're a member of the body. Now, though, here's where your works come in. People want to do works. Now that you're saved, if you trust Christ, you got to get on, get busy, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Titus 3 is all about good works. We'll help you with that. That's what this ministry is here to do. We will help build you up in the grace of God. That's why I have to teach this message. I have to teach Romans on Sundays and, and, and Paul's epistles. They've been on my heart. So that's what we're going to do. Because it's going to be Paul's epistles that teach you how to serve the living God as his child. Okay? We'll help you with that. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the word of truth. We thank you that we can get into your word and study your word and most importantly believe your word, the Holy Scriptures. Father, your, your word has enough in it for a sincere, and I repeat, sincere seeker to know you. But they have to believe that you exist and that you prove your existence if they diligently seek you. You're a gentleman. You're, you're gentle. You don't force yourself on people. But if they have ears to hear, you'll open their spiritual eyes so they might see the truth. Just like Elijah told Elijah, Elijah, there's a chariot of fire and an army, angelic army right over on that mountain. You can't see it. He says, God opened his eyes so you can see it. And then he saw it. It was there all the time. The truth of your word has been ministered to those who, who, who are listening today, both in person and through this technology of, of uh, internet. And so, Father, for any, anyone out there who hasn't trusted your son, may they do it now. And any saints out there who are kind of on the fence and kind of just, you know, not giving it their all after salvation to serve you in the grace of God, May this message be an encouragement to them. Father, we're going to take a break for 15 minutes and have our Q&A. We give you thanks and praise for this opportunity, this new ministry, and, and the radio outreach ministry in about an hour or so. We, we do thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.